Greetings. I am Dr. Javed Butler. I serve as the president of the Baylor Scott and White Research Institute in Dallas, Texas, and also as a professor of medicine at the University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi. Along with me to discuss advances in management of patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction are two of my respected colleagues and friends, Dr. Beacon Boskert. Thank you, Javed. Uh, this is Beacon Boskert, professor of medicine from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. I'll turn it over to Alana. And hi, I'm Dr. Alana Morris. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Great to have both of you. So who better to start this discussion than Dr. Boskert, who co-chaired the ACC AHA HFSA guidelines for the management of patients with heart failure. So lots of activity there. Beacon, can you just enlighten us about what's new in the guidelines? Thank you, Javed. First and foremost, we have first-line quadruple therapy, which now includes sodium gl uh, glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, in addition to beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and RAS inhibition with ARNI in NYHA class 2 to 3, or ACE inhibitor and ARB in NYHA class two to four heart failure patients. So the first line therapy now includes these four classes, and uh, these are um, agents that have been shown to be beneficial in the reduction of uh, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. And all patients, regardless of how stable they look, should be optimized with this quadruple therapy. So Beacon, can I uh, unfold this a little bit more with you? So is there any particular focus on how to sequence these four therapies or it depends on the clinical situation or the clinician? In the guidelines, we did not specify uh, the sequencing uh, of one agent over the other, but we did specify the necessity to up titrate and optimize as quickly as possible, and did mention that the optimization can be achieved with one to two week titration. And uh, the critical concept to keep in mind is yes, the sequencing and which one to initiate first can be individualized according to specific etiology and patient factors, such as their hemodynamic character characterization, acuity of illness, as well as other indications they may have, such as kidney disease and or other etiologies. But importantly, regardless of which one to start with, the concept is to optimize the four classes as quickly as possible. Great. So, you know, we know from data from registries that even in before the era of SGLT2 inhibitors, say registries up until three years ago, uh, even when the standard of care was triple therapy, uh, a lot of the patients were not getting appropriate therapy. Now it's quadruple foundational therapy. So that's one fact that we really need to do well in, uh, in implementing therapy. But Alana, let me bring you in. We also know for a fact that in clinical trial setting, even on a very good baseline therapy in SGLT2 inhibitor arm, in other words, quadruple therapy, there was a significant residual risk for the patient. So if somebody is continuing to have symptomatic heart failure on standard of care, are there any new therapies otherwise for those patient populations? Absolutely. And I think the guidelines give us some hint as to what else we can use. For example, there is a new agent named Verisigwat that has made it to these guidelines. And we can use this compound in patients who've had recent worsening heart failure defined by a recent heart failure hospitalization or the requirement for IV diuretics. So this is probably a lot of our patients. And as you mentioned, Javid, this could potentially be patients who are on four drug therapy and yet still have some residual risk that's defined by those two events. We also want to think about sort of non-heart failure related comorbidities, if you will. So for example, many of our patients have iron deficiency with or without anemia and the guidelines encourage us to replete those patients with intravenous iron for many years. Many of us have been using oral iron and we really wanna to try to use IV iron because we've shown some very significant improvements in functional status and quality of life. We also know that some of our patients, as Beacon mentioned, who've got chronic kidney disease or other comorbidities that limit our ability to up titrate some of the old but good RAS inhibitors, we now have evidence for some of the potassium binders. So we have a couple of those that we can use to try to lower potassium levels in patients who are at risk for hyperkalemia, which will allow us to use some of the RAS inhibitors that we know improve morbidity and mortality in these patients who are very high risk. And uh, there was a lot of interest about inotropes. Uh, can you say a little bit about more about omocaptin mecarbil? 
Well, Omicampton McCarvel has not quite made the guidelines. Maybe Beacom could educate us as to what the thoughts were from the guideline committee as to what we should do with that agent or what we might expect to see in the future. So let, let me ask you one more question. You know, the you know the folks who think about heart failure all the time, like yourself and 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 me. I mean, you know, we think about these classifications for heart failure and the evolution, but there's a lot of you know sort of confusion in the primary care setting about uh, whether to divide heart failure in two categories or three categories. Can you just tell us the universal definition and the classification of heart failure where things stand right now? Of course, um, in terms of our um, approach to heart failure, it's becoming standardized. And the universal definition of heart failure has defined heart failure as an individual with symptoms and signs that's attributable to structural and or functional cardiac abnormality corroborated by evidence of increased filling pressures either by elevated natriuretic peptide levels and or objective evidence of increased filling pressures either non-invasively and or, or by um, uh, hemodynamic characterization. Now in the guidelines, we're very much harmonized with this concept uh, with the recognition that either um, LV systolic dysfunction or elevated filling pressures, especially in the mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction is useful. Classification according to EF is very much harmonized both in the universal definition as well as in the guidelines and is defined as heart failure with reduced EF, mildly reduced EF, preserved EF and improved EF. Classes for stages of heart failure also are revised both in the universal definition as well as the heart failure guidelines and are with terminology that are better understood by patients and non-specialists and include at risk for heart failure for stage A, pre-heart failure for stage B, which now includes elevated biomarkers, even in the absence of symptoms defining the pre-heart failure stage, uh, simple heart failure for stage C, and uh, advanced heart failure for stage D. And all of these classes now have specific recommendations in the guidelines. So, well, let's then dig into the guidelines. So we are focusing on novel therapies and Alana mentioned very Seguad, IV iron, uh, uh, omicaptor mecarbil is one of the new medications. I guess it's not in the guideline, potassium binders, but also for patients with persistent symptoms, there are some, some oldies, not necessarily novel therapies like digoxin and hydralazine nitrates. So can you tell us what the guidelines are saying about all of these agents and, and, and what do they say about heart failure with mildly reduced EF? After the first step of optimization of quadruple uh, core therapies, uh, we do have a step two. In African-American Black patients, hydralazine nitrates are indicated as a class one. Uh, and then one should consider the ICD CRTD. Additional therapies can be considered among patients with heart failure with reduced once the core therapies are optimized. And these include ivabradine in patients with a heart rate exceeding that of 70, uh, despite optimal doses of beta blockade. That's a class 2A recommendation or digoxin may be considered to reduce hospitalizations or the soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator may be con uh, considered to reduce heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death as a class 2B recommendation. Polyunsaturated fatty acids and the potassium binders in the setting of hyperkalemia when using RAS inhibitors also have class 2B recommendations. And uh, the whole art of how to optimize these therapies will need to be individualized. The comorbidity treatment, we have specific recommendations for comorbidities in diabetes. We have the HGLT2 inhibitors, optimal treatment of hypertension, IV iron for iron deficiency anemia, um, consideration of AFib ablation for those individuals whose symptoms can be attributed to AFib in the setting of heart failure are such uh, optimization uh, considerations. For mildly reduced EF, in the aftermath of the Emperor Preserve trial, we now have HGLT2 inhibitors as a class 2A recommendation, whereas the other agents, which relied on post-doc analyses of former trials, we have class 2B recommendations with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ARNI, MRA, and beta blockade. So the mildly reduced EF now includes also the HGLT2 inhibitors as a class 2A and other agents as a class 2B indication.
We did not have omicamtiv in the guidelines, partly because it's not FDA approved. For an agent to be included in the guidelines, they need to be FDA approved, even though in the galactic HF trial, uh, the evidence um, um, or the um, outcome of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization achieved significance um, in patients with um, uh, symptomatic heart failure. There was also evidence of heterogeneity. Those with a lower EF, EF less than 28%, appear to have more benefit. And thus, I think we will need to await for further information as to whether this agent will be a, a good, um, perhaps, option for those individuals with very advanced heart failure and low EF. So this is incredibly helpful information, Beacon, what you, what you just told us. So we are running out of time. So let me have a wrap here and give the last word to Alana. Uh, Alana, open-ended question. Can you give our audiences some hint, some advice about how to, how to implement these therapies, uh, how to use them, combinations, just, just some general advice from a practical clinical perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the first piece of advice is avoid clinical inertia. So Beacon gave us a hint a few minutes ago that we want to get these, these drugs on board at low dose as opposed to using time to titrate to high dose as we've seen in the past. We want to try to get all four drugs on board as quickly as possible and perhaps bringing patients back to clinic in one to two weeks, either by telemedicine or an in-person visit to really try to get all four of these drugs on board. And then if patients still have persistent heart failure symptoms, to think about some of the other drug therapies that we talked about that are beyond those four foundational pillars of therapy. Again, the idea is for us to try to be as aggressive as we can as clinicians. We now have so many different drug options to choose from, and it is really up to us to try to get these patients on all of these therapies. Well, we will uh, end with those uh, so sage words and that advice. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, learning from you and hope this was of help to our uh, audiences and to the patients that they take care of. So thank you very much, uh, Alana. Thank you very much, uh, Beacom. Thank you. Thank you, Javed.